Why do you think the city chose you? Well, we've always started by working with the city first before launching. We created the first pilot program with Washington, D.C., and put that in place before we put scooters on the ground. And we've also invested in technology that serves not just riders, but pedestrians, cyclists in the bike lane. Technology is designed not just for the people using it, but for the broader community. I think both of those resonated with San Francisco. Now, uh, this is the only uh, scooter company that hasn't received a cease and desist. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you know, you've got the other bigger players out there like Lime with this saying, you know, this decision is disappointing. San Franciscans deserve an equitable and transparent process when it comes to transportation and mobility. Instead, the SFMTA has selected inexperienced scooter operators that plan to learn on the job at the expense of the public good. Sanjay, what's your response to that? Well, you know, we've been operating uh, actually electric scooters longer than Lime has. Um, we're pretty experienced in working to provide services that don't just benefit the riders, but the community themselves. And that's an approach that I think is equally important. It's a new industry. Everyone's learning as they go. We're excited to test and refine our systems in San Francisco. Virginia, what do you make of these sort of vastly different decisions from San Francisco and Santa Monica? Well, I think San Francisco is also a unique city. We found in our study that perceptions of electric scooters were actually dramatically different in San Francisco versus many other U.S. cities, which for the most part found that the majority of people um, really appreciated having a new transportation solution. And I think there's a backdrop of um, history here in San Francisco that may have affected how decisions have played out. Um, that being said, I think that there are a lot of opportunities for a lot of different companies to make a difference in, in cities across so I think you're referring to uh, you know, battles with the ride hailers like Uber and Lyft that came before this. Um, but you know, if, if San Franciscans are more open to scooters, then why would the city be more um, closed? Uh, well, we actually found that San Franciscans um, were not as open to scooters as most other U.S. cities, surprisingly, uh, because there is a backdrop, we think, of perhaps anti-tech sentiment in the Bay Area. It's sort of an experimental playground for a lot of companies. Um, and so I think that what happens in San Francisco may not necessarily be reflective of, of what happens in other so, cities. So, Sanjay, how do you work with that when you can only put 625 scooters on the road? That's not a lot. It's not a lot. We hope that number goes up over time. I think electric bike share in San Francisco is a good example of how the city worked with different providers, created a permit process, and, and ended up with a system that hasn't had that kind of backlash. That's the same approach we think will work here, and sometimes that means staging the number of vehicles and increasing it over time instead of putting them all out on the road on day one. So, Regina, you guys have, have uh, done a lot of research on how transportation is evolving in cities, how it's impacting communities. What are the shifts you expect to see? Like, how many people actually want to use scooters and will use scooters? Um, so what we found that was really surprising is that the adoption rates of mobility services have really rapidly accelerated. Um, in just 12 months, electric scooter share services attracted about 3% of the population in major urban areas. Um, it took car sharing services before them about 12 years to reach that point. Um, and one of the reasons is smartphone penetration is ubiquitous. Basically, every city has um, very large portions of the population, 80% plus, who have access to smartphones. Um, we see these services uh, most likely growing, and there are network effects um, across multiple operators and services. And so we're excited to see what happens in the future. Now, Sanjay, while you have been patiently waiting, you have these competing scooter companies that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, how does that put you at a long-term advantage? Well, the funny thing is that money is being used to expand into a lot of cities very quickly, but sometimes with the same results you're seeing in San Francisco, which is pausing, waiting, running a permit process, and then choosing to deploy. Or in other cities like Washington, D.C. or Portland, every operator has the same number of scooters, and extra capital doesn't get you extra market share because there's caps for each operator. So that capital actually doesn't end up being an advantage. What's the advantage is actually working with cities uh, to create these permit processes and collaborating with them to create a long-term relationship. That's actually the value in the long run. Talk to us about your expansion plans. You're, you're in D.C., you're in Portland. You know, how do you plan to grow into other cities if you, you are the ones that are, that are going to be more patient? Well, the, the process that a lot of these cities are going through can vary in terms of how fast the permits are actually approved. So larger cities, New York, Chicago, Boston, are going to take more time. Smaller cities might choose to put out permits sooner. Um, and we've been talking with all of these cities. So San Francisco is a conversation we started last year. And sometimes these things take longer, and that's okay because we want to roll it out in the right way. 
So, Regina, you know, do you think other cities will respond in the same way San Francisco has? I mean, for example, Airbnb is battling with New York, but we don't see uh, city regulators across the country having those same battles with Airbnb. Is San Francisco going to be a unique case, um, or will other uh, cities take San Francisco's lead and have a similar response? Um, we believe that in the particular case of micromobility that cities will in fact put in place more regulations than previous transportation services like Uber and Lyft that came before them. Um, there are a couple of key reasons. Number one, um, they're lightweight, they're small, and they're stationary, and so they're easy to throw in the back of a truck or a van and confiscate. And so it's easy to enforce regulations. Um, there's already been a precedent set by Washington, D.C., Portland, Austin, numerous cities that have established similar permitting processes before San Francisco, um, and most other cities are, are following suit. So, Ajay, how profitable can this business be? I mean, you don't have the drivers that, that Uber and Lyft have to pay, mm -hmm. but there's also a question of how many people are actually going to use these. Uh, yes, yeah, so we've actually seen a pretty broad swath of population using them, people outside kind of the expected demographic, and I think your study showed that with, with data. Um, the key driver for this business's profitability is actually the operating cost of the fleet. Uh, a lot of people are using consumer-grade vehicles that don't last very long, that require a lot of repair and daily charging, and we think that designing a custom vehicle that's actually optimized for fleet use is both safer and more profitable in the long run. Either way, though, there's got to be consolidation in this industry. This many scooter players cannot survive. Wouldn't you agree? I think it depends on how the city regulatory um, issues play out. You know, a lot of cities have said we want two, three, four players. We're going to grant an equal number. And that's what the next 12 to 24 months at least is going to look like. After that, we'll see.